It's a privilege to bring the Word of God to you this morning. Grateful to Pastor Leek for the opportunity to, to support him and his ministry among us. It's no secret that in the last 2,000 years, Jesus has been the central figure of human history. You cannot ignore Jesus. Virtually every religion that began after the life of Jesus, and even some that began before, have something to say about Jesus. They have to explain him. After all, the work and the person of Jesus Christ is so transcendent, so magnificent, so compelling, so unparalleled, that you must, if you're going to explain anything about history or religion, you simply must have something to say about Jesus. So here's what they say. Religious Jews view Jesus as a false Messiah, who though he was a cut above the rest, he was uh, negatively, he negatively impacted the Jewish faith. He was just one in a long line of deceitful men, though, who claimed to be a Messiah of God. Muslims view Jesus as one in a long line of prophets sent from Allah, but he was superseded by Muhammad. Muslims are required to believe in Jesus, but only as a mere man and prophet. After all, they attest to his virgin birth and miraculous works, but it was all the work of Allah, not Jesus empowered by the Spirit. Jesus did not actually die on the cross, they say. Some would say he ascended to heaven before he actually died. Others would say it was just someone who looked like Jesus on the cross. Mormons believe Jesus is a created spirit, brother of all created spirits, including Lucifer and you and I. They say he was conceived in the same manner as all men are, the result of the union between God the Father and Mary. His death atoned for Adam's sin only, and therefore you and I are left to pay for our own sins through our good deeds and obedience. They teach that Jesus married three women at least and had children by them. Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus is the created, only begotten Son of God, that He is the first creation of God and therefore does not have the divine nature of God. He agreed to be transferred to Mary's womb and eventually atoned for the sins of mankind, becoming the eternal father to humanity. Christian scientists view Jesus as a mere man who was the first to achieve the divine mind. He did not die on the cross, but demonstrated that all matter is an illusion. Therefore, he could not die. Oneness Pentecostals view Jesus as One of the many masks worn by God. Sometimes God wears the Father mask, sometimes the Jesus mask, and sometimes the Holy Spirit mask. But those three persons are not separate persons. They are all one and the same, indistinct from one another. Unitarian Universalists really view Jesus as a great religious teacher, but nothing more. We could go on and on and on. Every religion has something to say about Jesus. In fact, virtually everywhere you turn in the world, people have some opinion. There's images and statues of Jesus all over the world. But just because someone says they believe in Jesus doesn't mean that they believe in the true Jesus. Jesus' counterfeits abound. Just like in December, there's a host of calorically challenged men in red robes pretending to be the the omniscient and the benevolent and the omnipresent Santa Claus. Just as counterfeit currency looks like monopoly money to the trained eye, once the true Jesus is seen and proclaimed and known, all the counterfeits melt away like wax figures under the sun. The true Son of God is far brighter, more intense, more radiant, more compelling, and more transforming than all the counterfeits combined. To believe in a false Jesus is to be left hopeless and unchanged. But to believe in the true Jesus is to be transformed into His image from one degree of glory to another. 
If you want to see Jesus today, if you want to know the true and living Jesus who is divine, eternal, creator, savior, and victorious, turn with me to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. The Gospel of John is unique from the Gospels of Matthew Mark and Luke, those three Gospels are what we often call the synoptic Gospels because they give us a synopsis of the life of Jesus, of his teaching and of his works, essentially walking through the life and ministry of Jesus in a mostly chronological order. John takes a different approach because he has a distinct purpose in his writing, and he tells us his purpose in John chapter 20, verse 30, which says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This means that everything that John writes about Jesus, every scene he portrays, every teaching he transcribes, all serve the singular purpose Namely, that you would see and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and, having believed, would have life in His name. And even though that purpose is stated almost at the very end of the book, there is no questioning, question that in these opening verses of chapter 1, that is exactly what John is trying to communicate. We're going to look at verses 1 through 5 today. But even all the way through verse 15 of chapter 1, John introduces to us the themes and concepts he emphasizes time and time again throughout the gospel. So in essence, in looking at chapters 1 through 5, we're getting in a, in a small nutshell what the whole book is about. So if you're there, John chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 18 to get us started and give the context, but we'll just focus the message on verses 1 through 5. Follow along as I read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Light shines in the darkness, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from John, from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He, John, was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. If we only had verses 1 through 5, we wouldn't really know who this word is. But we're given a clue in verse 14 when it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then in verse 17, this word is named Jesus Christ. So while verses 1 to 5 don't use the given name of Jesus, they declare to us in no uncertain terms the majestic person and work of Jesus Christ. We're going to take each verse, just one at a time, and we're going to see that Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, is divine, 
eternal, creator, savior, and victorious. Let's begin with divine. Look and believe in the divine Jesus of verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, was with God, and the Word was God. Only two books in the Bible start with the words in the beginning. I bet you could guess what they are. Genesis and John. Genesis begins in the beginning, God. John begins here, in the beginning was the word. Though distinct in purpose, both statements essentially portray the same reality. In Genesis, it refers to that eternal moment in which God acted to create the universe. In John, it refers to that eternal moment in which the Word existed. In other words, both tell us that prior to the material world coming into being, God and the Word existed. In that moment, Genesis says, God was. And in that moment, John says, the Word was. But notice what John says next. He says, the Word was with God, which is to say there is a distinction between God and the Word. They are not one and the same. In fact, to say the Word was with God is kind of a a mild translation. You can more accurately translate it to say the Word was face to face with God. It implies not merely that they coexisted, they occupied different realms of whatever you could call the non-existent material world, but rather that they were together in divine unity. They enjoyed an unfathomable, infinite, eternal relationship. But before we say too much, look at the last phrase. John adds, the word was God. Notice he does not say God was the word, nor does he say the word was a God. You might find those translations out there in the world, but such translations would be ignoring the rules of Greek grammar. No, what he says is exactly right. The word was with God and the word was God. This introduces us to the idea that there is more to God than meets the eye. Jesus, the word, can be both God and with God. Now, obviously, we'll never be able to cross this vast ocean of truth, but we can wade into the water a little bit by considering why John would even use the word to refer to Jesus rather than his own name. The word translates the Greek term logos, and because logos is a rich and full uh, word in in Greek philosophy, some are quick to say here that John is borrowing from that Greek philosopher's Uh, And he intends to mean that Jesus is the embodiment of the rational principle that runs the universe. While there might be some points of intersection with the truth there, we we have to remember two important points. One, John was a fisherman, not a philosopher. And second, he was writing to Jews, not to Greeks. Therefore, we ought not to walk down the halls of the academy and step into the philosophy classroom, but rather we should look at how the Jews understood the word out of their own textbook. And when we do that, we find that they too had a rather clear and rich understanding of logos. So John's use of the term here is intentional. Let me quickly point out five characteristics of the word from the Hebrew scriptures, which is our Old Testament. Five characteristics of the word. First, they understood that the Word was the agent of creation. The agent of creation. God spoke everything into existence. Let there be light. And there was light. Psalm 33, 6 declares this, saying, By the the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of His mouth all their host." agent of creation. Second, they also understood that the word was the agent of salvation. Psalm 119 verse 41 says, May your loving kindness also come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your word. 
The word of God reveals the loving kindness and one could even say brings salvation. Third, they understood that the word was the agent of accomplishing God's will. The agent accomplishing God's will. Isaiah 55 verses 10 and 11 says, For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and uh, making it bear and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. It's the agent accomplishing God's will. Fourth, they understood as they understood the word as the agent of God's relationship with his people. Over a hundred times in the Old Testament, you hear the words, and the word of the Lord came, and the word of the Lord came. And in those various situations, the word was personified as coming, God coming to his people to comfort, to encourage, to instruct, and even rebuke and strengthen them. And then finally, fifth, the Jews understood the word as the agent of God's revelation. This would seem obvious. The prophets were sent from God to proclaim the word of God to the nation. To call them to repentance, to warn of future judgment and promise future salvation. Seven of the twelve minor prophets begin with the words, The word of the Lord came to Hosea or Joel or Jonah or Micah. So when John refers to Jesus as the word, he is saying to every Jew and every Gentile that the word of God who creates, who saves, who works, who relates, and who reveals is now in the flesh and his name is Jesus Christ. The word of God is the manifestation of God to mankind. In the Old Testament, it was through powerful words and sentences and paragraphs. In the New Testament, it is through a man named Jesus. That's why the author of Hebrews writes, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. Now listen, scripture is very clear that God is the one who created the world. God does not share his glory with anyone. Only God bears the divine nature and only God can uphold the universe with his power. And so, when those things are attributed to Jesus, there can be no other conclusion except that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Word, and the Word was God. By the way, that's not just John's interpretation of who Jesus is. This is Jesus' own self-understanding. In chapter 5 of John, he says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he, Jesus, not only was breaking the Sabbath, but he was actually calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Near the end of the gospel, in the last account that John uses to declare this Jesus, we hear Thomas crying out to Jesus, My Lord and my God. And Jesus accepted worship as God. My friends, Jesus is no mere man. He is no mere teacher or prophet or enlightened leader. He is God in the flesh. Believe in the divine Jesus. We'll look now and believe in the eternal Jesus in verse 2. John writes, He was in the beginning with God. He said, didn't he just say that? (laughs) Yes, he absolutely said that. He repeats it for emphasis so that we don't miss what he's trying to say, especially in light of what's coming next. So just in case we missed it, he says again, he was in the beginning with God. Or more literally translated, it's like he's saying, this one was in the beginning with God. You know, the word, this one, the one I'm talking about, he was in the beginning with God. 
Verse 1 focuses on the deity of Christ. Verse 2 focuses on the eternality of Christ. In other words, we know Jesus is God because he has the divine nature of God. But we also know he is God because he is eternal and only God is eternal. These two truths are brought together in John 8 when Jesus is having an argument with the Jewish leaders and jumping into the middle of that conversation, Jesus says to them, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? You see, Abraham lived 1,500 years before the life of Jesus. And the Jews are like, who are you to claim that you know Abraham? Well, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, what? I am. And then John writes, therefore, they picked up stones to throw at him. The Lord God of Israel was, I am. And Jesus declares about himself, I am. Not I was, not I will be, not I am becoming, but I am. We cannot imagine what it was like for the Son of God who enjoyed that infinite and perfect union with the Father and the Holy Spirit for all eternity past. We cannot imagine what it was like for him to leave that perfect union and be born as a man. Is it any wonder that Jesus spent his nights in solitude and prayer with the Father? No, Jesus did not achieve enlightenment. He did not become a God. He was not a spirit, created spirit, transferred to the material world. He is the eternal and divine Jesus in whom we must believe. Well, look now and believe in the creator Jesus of verse 3. It says, all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. To state his case as clearly as possible, John says the same thing twice, positively and negatively. Positively, he says, all things came into being through him. We saw that. Did we not in Psalm chapter, uh, Psalm 33, verse 6, that by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made? We heard that as well in Hebrews chapter 1, that it was through Jesus that all things were created. But we also heard it in the words of Colossians that we read during our scripture reading, verse 16, where it says, For by him all things were created, both in the heavens, on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. Someone might say, I thought Genesis 1 said that God created all things. Well, you're right. That's exactly what it says. But we also see that God created in concert with others. Does not verse 26 of Genesis 1 say, Let us make man in our image? according to our likeness? Yes, it does say that. And it also says in verse 2 of Genesis 1, the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters, which would indicate to us that the Holy Spirit was also involved in creation. So who created all things? Was it God? Was it Jesus? Was it the Spirit? Well, here's how we can say it. Creation is by the Father, through the Son, overseen by the Spirit, by the Father, through the Son, overseen by the Spirit. Creation was a Trinitarian event. The entire Godhead was involved. So both statements are true. God created the heavens and the earth, and Jesus made all things. Now, someone could say, as some religions do, as I noted earlier, that Jesus did in fact create all things after he himself was created. But to that, John says here in the negative, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. That means that if anything can be described as having come into being, it came into being through Christ. 
which means that Jesus himself did not come into being. He doesn't fit that category as having come into being. He was, he always has been. Jesus not only created the universe, but we even see him doing acts of creation throughout the Gospel of John. In John 2, he creates wine, right? In John 5, he creates life in dead limbs. In John 6, he creates food for thousands. In John 9, he creates sight for blind eyes. And in John 11, he creates life from a dead body. Behold and believe in the Creator Jesus. Look then and believe in the Savior Jesus in verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Life here is not biological life, bios, but spiritual life, zoe. The word, Jesus, contains within himself true life. He is self-existent. We call that aseity. He has aseity. He is self-existent. He is not dependent on anyone or anything outside of himself for life because he himself is life. Jesus said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He also said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus has life in himself. He is life. Therefore, he alone can give life. Now, we're all born spiritual beings, but our spirits are born dead to sin, or excuse me, dead to God and alive to sin. When Jesus gives us life, we are alive to God and now dead to sin. And that's exactly what Jesus came to give. He said in John 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In this gospel of John, John speaks of salvation not only in terms of life, but also in terms of light. He introduces us to that fact here when he says the life was the light of men. Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The Jews no doubt would have thought of Psalm 36, verse 9, which says, For with you, God, is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. As I said, we're born spiritually dead to God, and we need life. We're also born, Scripture says, spiritually blind. And we need to be given life, light, so that we can see. Jesus is not only life and the life giver, he is also light and the life, light giver. Excuse me. (laughs) Scripture says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In Jesus is life, and the life was the light of men. Jesus came to give life and light to a dark world. And if we who walk in darkness would run to the light and not away from the light, then he will give us light and life. So far we've seen that the true Jesus is the divine Jesus, the eternal Jesus, the creator Jesus, and the Savior, Jesus. Finally, look and believe in the victorious Jesus in verse 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Darkness, as John is using it here, is not the absence of light. It is rebellion against the light. It is the evil forces that have set themselves in opposition to the light. You see, Jesus did not come to a world that opened its arms to him. We read there in verse 11 that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. Yes, of course, people loved his healing. They loved his miracles. They were enraptured by his teaching. But when he didn't fulfill their desires for the Romans to be kicked out and establishing Jewish independence, they had no use for Jesus. When Jesus was betrayed in the garden, he said to the chief priests, 
Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour in the power of darkness. You see, there was more at work than malcontent men and wicked people in the death of Christ. The spiritual forces of darkness had set themselves against Christ throughout his whole life, and they kicked into high gear and insulted Jesus at every turn. They threw everything they could think of at him, temptation, demonic oppression, false teaching, anything they could think of. And when it seemed there was nothing left to try, the the door was open to them to try to do what they'd always wanted to do, to kill him. So when Jesus gave himself up to be arrested, he was at the same time giving himself up to the spiritual forces of darkness to do whatever they would want to do. In verse 5 here, John says, the darkness did not comprehend it. Your translation, the ESV or others might say, overcome. Translating this as comprehend has led some to think that what John is communicating here is that the darkness didn't understand Jesus. They just didn't get him. That doesn't really make sense because as you read the Gospels, you find out that really the only people that understood who Jesus was was the demons, (laughs) right? They would say, I know who you are, Holy One of God. This translation, comprehend, goes back to John Wycliffe's translation in the 14th century. It's a 700-year-old word. The word has changed a little bit since then. In fact, even in the last 200 years, it's changed. If you go to the 1828 Webster Dictionary, it defines comprehend this way. Quote, literally, to take in, to take with, to take together, to contain, to include, or to comprise. And then the dictionary gives this example of use of the term The empire of Great Britain comprehends. You can tell it's an old dictionary. The empire of Great Britain comprehends, which means that the empire at that time was made up of a variety of territories. Now, we don't use a term like that anymore, except when we use the word comprehensive. If a class is comprehensive, it means it covers a wide array of subject and content for that subject matter. But it's interesting that we find the same Greek term in John chapter 12, verse 35, where Jesus says, walk while you have the light so that the darkness will not overtake you. You go to almost any English translation and it's translated that way even back in the older translations. So the idea of darkness or overtaking or comprehending is the idea of the darkness trying to consume the light to make the light a part of itself and thereby extinguish the light. That's what Satan attempted to do in the wilderness when he tempted Jesus and tried to make Jesus his servant. More than that, at the cross, the power of darkness sought to extinguish the light through the power of death. And they thought they succeeded. Until the light dawned on the third day. The darkness had its time in the ring and it could not overcome the light. Indeed, the light overcame the darkness. And that is why John doesn't say it shone, but it shines in the darkness. The light is forever shining, never losing its brilliance and radiance. He is there for all to see because he stands victorious over the powers of darkness. Friends, Jesus did not escape the darkness. He didn't deceive the darkness. He didn't avoid the darkness. No, he stepped into the darkness, overcame the darkness, and continually shines his light so that all who would look on the sun and believe would be saved. Do you see him? Do you see the divine, eternal, creator, savior, victorious Jesus? Is your Jesus the one who created the hundreds of billions of stars and outshines them all? Is your Jesus the author of life who was put to death 
for the sake of sinners, but has come back to life and gives it to those who would trust in him. Knowing this Jesus is worth more than all the riches of the world. I don't know if you make New Year's resolutions, but we should all resolve with Paul to count all things as worthless because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ. May we resolve in our own hearts in this age of increasing persecution and opposition to the Lord to suffer the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that we may gain Christ and be found in him. This magnificent and glorious God of the universe came in the flesh to give us life. Jesus again said in John 14 that true life, eternal life is knowing God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. This is our glorious Christ. Now as we close, I want to work through with you four necessary responses to the glorious Christ. Four necessary responses. First, as we've been saying, the necessary response to this glorious Christ is to believe in Him. And maybe you're here or watching online and you haven't known the true Jesus. Maybe you're here with family or friends or because maybe your New Year's resolution was to go to church more often and and you've never heard of who Jesus actually is. You've been looking to someone or something else to give you that sense of forgiveness, to give you salvation however you have thought it would be defined. I would urge you, turn to the true Jesus and believe on Him. Turn away from your empty efforts to obtain for yourself something that you can never obtain, but that God freely offers you if you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing, nothing can save you from the penalty you deserve except believing in Jesus who died on the cross for your sin. Today is the day of salvation. Turn away from your sin and those things you've held on to for years. Let go of that rope of self-effort and fall into the, the safety net of the grace and mercy of God. Maybe you've been wandering from the truth and going after the world thinking that you would find happiness apart from Christ. My friends, you will only find destruction there. So flee from those shores and run to the shelter that is Christ. Return to the rock who rescues us from the wrath of God. Look to Jesus. No matter what happens in the world, Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. And if you believe, you will have life in his name. That's the first necessary response to the glorious Christ. The second necessary response to the glorious Christ is to fear him. Fear him. One of the primary descriptions in scripture of unbelievers is that they do not fear God. Though his power is revealed in creation and eternity is set in their heart and the law of God is written in the heart, they do not fear him. They're often oblivious to the coming judgment. Jesus said in John 3, He who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. The suffering and pain that we experience in this world is, if you will, a down payment to the suffering that those who do not believe in Christ will experience for all eternity. As the author of Hebrews writes, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Unbelievers should fear the glorious Christ. 
But believers should fear him as well. Those who've had their sins forgiven, who've been given new life and adopted into the family of God, we need not fear the wrath of God, but we ought to live in awe and reverence of this divine, eternal, creator, saving, and victorious Jesus. He is the transcendent God. He is holy and majestic and powerful. We ought not to treat him like he is one of us. The Apostle John was one of Jesus' closest friends. He spent years with him. He rested on his bosom. And yet when John got a glimpse of the glorious Christ in the book of Revelation, John said, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I couldn't stand before this man. We too, those who believe, will stand before Christ and give an account of how we have stewarded the resources and the time and the opportunities he's entrusted to us. When we see him face to face for the first time, we will come to grips with the awesome privilege that it is to be saved and to serve him. Perhaps we will mourn because we will wish that we had done more for this glorious Christ. But at the same time, whatever regret we have will be overwhelmed by his compassion and his grace and his love. That complex of emotions that we will have then, we should cultivate now as we get to know him more and more. We must fear this glorious Christ. The third necessary response to this glorious Christ is to serve him, to serve him. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. By virtue of his deity and his position and his work, he is over all things and especially of the church, and he demands that we serve him. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. And for those who do love him, his commandments are not burdensome. They're a joy. It is a joy and a delight to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever vocation he calls us to in life, we should make it our aim to work for his glory and to represent him faithfully in the world. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.15, And he died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. We're no longer our own. We've been bought by his blood. And so we must live and give of our lives wholly unto him for his purposes. We must believe, we must fear, and we must serve. And finally, the fourth necessary response to this glorious Christ is to proclaim him. To proclaim him. This last fall I read... At this point in my life, my, the favorite book that I've ever read called Gentle and Lowly. Some of you, I know many of you have either read it or been reading it or hope to read it. Since I read it, I've been evan- an evangelist to almost everyone I talk to. Most of the, or at least some of the people that I counsel, I force them to read it because it's so good. Maybe you've done the same thing with a book that you've read or a movie that you've watched or a product that you've benefited from. When something has blessed us and improved our lives, we tend to be natural evangelists telling other people about it. Beloved, when was the last time you talked to someone about Jesus? When was the last time you told someone what he has done for you and how he has changed you? When was the last time you invited someone to come to church and Hear about this glorious Christ who died for sinners, paying their penalty and offering forgiveness and eternal life. This is the main reason we exist on this earth. Jesus left this earth with a mission for all believers to make disciples, followers of Christ of all nations. This is why Hope Bible Church exists. If you look at our philosophy of ministry, which you can find on our website, it says this, the central commitment of Hope Bible Church is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of the universal church. 
This is clearly, it goes on, the role of the church as expressed in the Bible. In order to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, we follow the Bible's threefold purpose for the church. And for the sake of time, with regard to evangelism, it says, we reach out to the lost with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, speaking the truth in love, calling sinners to turn from their sin and embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. Hope Bible Church exists to proclaim Christ in all his glory. But we can go even further. We know that we're not the only church around. In the vision statement that Pastor League wrote about a year and a half ago, we read this. Again, you can find this on the website. We endeavor to be a church that has a significant and growing impact in our region and beyond wit- uh, and beyond by witnessing the gospel of Jesus, exporting biblical doctrine, planting new churches, and impacting other churches with a biblical philosophy of ministry. As servants of the kingdom of God, our concern reaches beyond our local church to the health and maturity of the surrounding churches and the worldwide church. In cooperation with other like-minded churches and organizations, we are committed to strengthening the greater body of Christ in the global evangelistic mission that Jesus gave his church, unquote. In other words, not only does Hope Bible Church exist to proclaim Christ, we exist to help other churches proclaim Christ. We want to so exalt the Lord Jesus Christ that more and more churches in our, in our region are equipped to proclaim Christ in ways and in places that we're not able to. This is who we are. This is what we're committed to being. This is why we do what we do. This is why we have a Bible Institute. This is why we have a counseling ministry. This is why we have an active fellowship of pastors in the region who get together regularly to encourage one another. I remember when I was in high school, I went to a church that did a 40 days of purpose where the leaders asked the people of the church to fast and pray for 40 days to help us figure out what we're supposed to be doing. Friends, that is not whole Bible church. We know what we're doing because it comes from God's word. And that is what we will do forever, God willing. But how about you? What is your role? What gifts do you have? What resources do you have? How can you use your time and energy and gifts to play a part in serving the body of Christ and proclaiming the name of Christ? Maybe it's serving behind the scenes in some way, like men and women who were here yesterday doing electrical work, turning on fans in the bathroom that apparently had never been turned on. Maybe you you can serve in security and you can kind of be behind the scenes making sure that all are safe and well. Maybe it's helping out with various administrative needs that various ministries have. Maybe it's starting new ministries that will enable us to proclaim Christ in new spheres in our society. Or maybe it's serving in in the existing ministries that we have in a multitude of ways. Beloved, this glorious Christ is worthy to be believed, to be feared, to be served, and to be proclaimed. The gospel will not be hindered by a pandemic. The gospel will only be hindered by people who stop proclaiming it. Let that not be us. The gospel will not be hindered by the government. The gospel will only be hindered by people who shrink back in fear. Let that not be us. Let us be people who believe on, fear, serve, and proclaim the divine, eternal, creator, saving, and victorious Jesus. He is our glorious Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. You are worthy, O Lord and our God, Jesus Christ, the Savior of those who would believe. You are worthy of all that we have to give. It all comes from you, and it's all given to us for you. Help us, O Lord, to proclaim your name, to be faithful witnesses to speak with boldness and clarity and love, 
to be your people on this earth, to not let any fear hold us back. For the sake of Christ, amen.